Well, um, good evening and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. Uh, my name is Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. And um, for those of you who aren't all that familiar with CIS, because I know there are some people here who are not members, um, CIS is a public policy research think tank or organisation. And uh, we've been in, uh, existed since uh, 1976. And we are primarily committed to promoting the principles of classical liberalism. And when I say classical liberalism, I'm talking about uh, individual freedom and choice, um, productivity enhancing economic reform, uh, individual freedom, um, productivity enhancing reforms and wide range of economic issues and uh, religious freedom and not least open and civilized debate uh, that uh, speaks beyond all that rampant polarization that all too often characterizes the public debate, uh, not just in Canberra, but across the Western world. Um, this evening, I'm delighted to introduce a friend and a former colleague, Greg Sheridan. Uh, Greg has been the foreign editor of the Australian newspaper for the best part of three decades. Uh, he's been a foreign correspondent and he has, for mine, one of the finest minds uh, in this country when it comes to politics, uh, our place in the world, and the Asia-Pacific region. Um, Greg is also a very prolific author. He's written some bestsellers and some very influential books. His new book is called God is Good For You. Uh, copies are sold uh, at the back there, at the reception area. And his argument here is to set out how modern Christians have never worked so hard to make the world a better place at a time when their faith has never been less valued. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Greg Sheridan. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks so much. It's great to be with, with you here with so many friends, old and new. Uh, Tom, uh, was a terrific journalist, and then he realised that there was no future in journalism. <laughs> and, uh, and I myself will soon have to decide whether I'm going to make a long-term career of this business uh, or not. Um, uh, it's, um, I have some particular friends in the audience. Did Sam, oh, there's Sam, Sam Lipsky. I thought he'd left after coming for the pre-free talk <laughs> drinks, which would have displayed his typical, normal, very good taste, I must say. Uh, <laughs> He would have um, he would have uh, uh, been in in, uh, in perfect justification in doing that. Now you have to admit, it is heroic heroic of you good folks to um, did did Brendan Purcell come tonight? Uh, oh hi Brendan, how are you? Now look, normally I say at this point, if you find anything you really dislike in my remarks or in my book. My wife is right there, and you're welcome to go and speak to her. Uh, <laughs> but I would like to add, Brendan Purcell was a tremendous help to me in this book. And, you know, you normally say, but of course, you know, the people who helped you are not responsible for any of your mistakes and foolish opinions and bad jokes. <coughs> I'd like to say Brendan is responsible for all of those, <laughs> uh, all of those things. And uh, anything that you find particularly disagreeable, it's two Irishmen talking to each other, really, and uh, he does make great jokes about the Old Testament, medieval theology, sort of jokey material, really. That uh, Now, you've got to admit, it's pretty heroic of you folks to come and be lectured at by a journalist, but to be lectured at by a journalist about God is really yeah, yeah. sort of the weirdest thing in the world, and it shows how broad-minded God is that he, <laughs> he would be willing to talk to a journalist, really. Um, you know, my publishers in the early uh, incarnation of this book had a line on the publicity blurb, something like, you know, Greg Sheridan's a committed Christian. And I saw it, I, I rang up, I said, mate, mate, you have got to take that line off, cut it out, what are you doing to me? And uh, he said, well, well, aren't you? And I said, no, no, look, no, no Catholic would ever say he's a good Catholic or anything like this. This is just... This is begging for disaster. Don't, and not only that, I've been a journalist for 40 years. Give me a break. It's not possible, you know. And um, just like some of my friends are trying to get G.K. Chesterton canonised, but he, <laughs> the man was a journalist. The case is finished, you know. Just leave it be. So what would I know about God? Well, 
we journalists certainly know a good deal about sin and wickedness and vice and cruelty and unhappiness, and um, that's the other side of life, of course. People often ask me, why did I write this book? One reason is because of the last book I wrote. So three years ago, I wrote a, a book called When We Were Young and Foolish, and indeed I am no longer young, so there has been a change there. <laughs> and uh, and um, the... By the way, this business of writing books, it's terribly addictive, you know. It's like, it's like a heroin addiction, or really it's like, it's as near as a bloke gets to the female experience of giving birth, because <laughs> you find there's a long gestation period which is increasingly uncomfortable, and then there is a shuddering, agonising climax of pain to produce the thing at the last, and you think to yourself, I'm never going to do that again. And then you think, well, the little fellow, he's quite clever, isn't he? You know? and <laughs> And a few years later, you find yourself just back in the same circumstance uh, that you're in. But the last, uh, the last book I wrote, I had the great pleasure of going to a number of um, writers' festivals around Australia, Byron Bay, the Sydney Writers' Festival, the Melbourne Writers' Festival, the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, that wonderfully misnamed uh, 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 thing. And um, never has there been a, a more predictable bunch of ideas collected... Uh, and what struck me was that, and, and at those festivals, by the way, I think I, I played the role of a semi-domesticated orc brought down from the hills amongst a large gatherings of very concerned hobbits who were, who were armed with their plowshares and their pike staffs and who were willing to deal with the orc if he caused trouble, but who nonetheless in their broad-mindedness tolerated him there for a while. But I was struck that amidst the hundreds of books at all those festivals, there was not one, not one which was uh, pro-Christian or which celebrated the Western tradition in any way. And um, this is a, an astonishing change from 50 or 60 years ago. In the 1950s, the best-selling books across secular culture were all Christian books. I'm not quite sure when Thomas Merton wrote his uh, great memoir, but it sold three million books, you know, he went on to become a Cistercian monk, took a vow of silence and never stopped prattling for the rest of his <laughs> life. God bless him. Because in the Catholic Church, we embrace paradox. We, we understand paradox. And uh, uh, st um, Henry Morton Robinson's novel, The Cardinal and so on, all of these books were, were massive bestsellers. The secular culture was devoted to it and not only had a, a, a genuine religious quality, but it was a celebration of, of a cultural inheritance. And now that cultural inheritance has sort of disappeared from, from our culture. And I thought, that's very weird. How can it be that there's not a, single, not a single book from that point of view? And the more I thought of it, the more I thought we are actually erasing from popular culture and to a large extent from our educational institutions any knowledge of the ideas and beliefs and transcendent values which formed our culture and formed our society. Now, in taking this road, we're going down a very eccentric path for any part of humanity. Um, in my day job, I'm the foreign editor of the Australian newspaper, which means I'm sort of sentenced to perpetual contemplation of Donald Trump. I mean, <laughs> the, one of the great joys of this book was that I escaped from Trump for a few months. And there were people who would ring me in January and say, oh, did you see what Trump said about China? And I said, look, comrade, I am in a Trump, <laughs> I am in a Trump free moment. I, my mind is in the book of Genesis. I, I'm reading <laughs> Brendan Purcell's jokes. You can, Trump can live without me for a month. You know, he can, but um, uh, it became clear to me that the, um, the road we're traveling down is a very eccentric road. As foreign editor, I spend a lot of my time in Asia, and of course, all throughout Asia, religion is a dynamic, central, normal part of human life. It, it's absurd to imagine Indonesia without a religious identity, or Thailand, or most of the parts of Asia. You might, you might proffer China as an alternative, but Christianity is on fire in China. There are more Christians in China than there are members of the Communist Party. The, force that the Communist Party fears, the only force in the whole of society is religion, not only Christianity but Buddhism, Falun Gong and, and various other uh, religious outcrops. 
So it's a very weird place that we're going. Western Europe, Australia and New Zealand, and North America. North America is more religious than we are, but it's got the same trends. The majority of religious folks are older folks, the majority of older folks are religious folks. So when the old folks die off, um, the young people are not uh, are much, much less religious. And the, they are a bit uh, less atheist than we are, and we are a bit more atheist than, say, Britain is, but we're all heading in the same direction. And then I, I wanted this, I wanted to answer some questions for myself in this book. What will the loss of God mean for our society? Now, the truth is that human beings are formed in a culture, and a culture without God will form radically different human beings from the ones we've had before. This is not remotely to idealise the past, and I don't in my book anywhere idealise the past. The past of foreign country had plenty of devils of its own, plenty of villains, lots of lots of bad things. I'm not defending the past, but not everything in the past was bad. And when you throw things out, sometimes you throw out good things. And a culture without God will form different human beings. What is the basis for human dignity without God? I think the loss of God threatens both the distinctiveness and the universality of the human experience in the West. If there is no God, if human beings who have derived their unique status historically from their divine relationship with God, if there is nothing, if we are just a chancy outcrop of the biosphere, then really we are no more, we have no more claim on special consideration than a cockroach. And if our message to all of humanity is just follow your dreams, that's a very bad message because human dreams are often terrible nightmares. What if your dream is to kill six million people? What if your dream is to have sex with six-year-olds? What, what is to prevent you following this dream? The only thing that prevents you then is the mediation of power. It's, so you're in this Nietzschean world where the only thing that counts really is power. That is not only dangerous, it's evil, and it's anti-human. So I think the, the loss of God will be very bad for our culture. It's also very bad for human beings. Part of this crisis of faith that we're living in, in my opinion, is a crisis of knowledge. You don't believe because you know. Belief, like love, is an act of the will rather than an act of the intellect. But nonetheless, it's hard to believe if you don't have any knowledge. Of course, that's not to put any limitations on the way that God reaches out to people and people find God. Nonetheless, if you wipe out Christianity from the public culture, it's very difficult for people when they finally have their own crisis of unbelief for them to come back to anything because they've never had anything in the first place that they can any longer come back to. And, of course, um, you know, in the words of Chesterton, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. And they go to very weird places uh, uh, as a result. So I thought the, the lack of knowledge of basic teachings, history, truths, content of Christianity was shocking. It's shocking in state schools. It's shocking in Christian schools. It's shocking in state universities. We've recently seen this appalling controversy where the ANU, the Australian National University, uh, you know, a splendid place, really. I often recall, re refer to it betraying my foreign policy background as our own federally administered tribal area in, uh, in Australia, the, the territory of the ANU where it rejected the idea of a bachelor's degree in Western civilization, And the rejection, the popular impetus for the rejection, the campus protest was that this would privilege uh, in a racist way the West. Western civilization means genocide, invasion, uh, oppression, and so on. And yet every book that was proposed for the syllabus of this uh, course in Western civilization was a critical book. I'm just in the process of making my first acquaintance with Dante. Now, the audience like this is so erudite. You've all read Dante in the original Italian, I know, and you've read the different translations, you've read the critical. So I'm just beginning. So naturally, I'm full of, you know, doctrinaire uh, knowledge on this matter. But Dante's book was, uh, Dante's poem, was in many respects a critique of the corruption of medieval Christianity. The idea that 
by studying the great books of Western civilization, you're going to have an uncritical view of Western civilization is completely absurd. But to keep that knowledge away from university and school students and ordinary average citizens struck me as an act of vandalism. So my book is a little, a little contribution. Uh, you know, it's a it's a thimbleful of content into an ocean uh, into an ocean of um, of confusion. Then there was the question of the rationality of belief. So I'd never read The New Atheist because I had no interest in them, really. But I thought I'd better read them for this book. And um, and what a chore it was. Honestly, they make Donald Trump look attractive, really. <laughs> and uh, But I went through this unbelievably tedious book of Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. It is the most pompous book I've ever read. He conceives of himself as sort of the Pope of atheism, really. And uh, it's just full of... Um, uh, ex cathedra petri statements of infallible uh, truth on his part. I read Christopher Hitchens, much better, much better writer than Dawkins, much more fun, full of outrageous, dishonest <laughs> things about Christianity. But having read The New Atheists, I realised they're actually not making a rational case. They're not, their arguments are so silly that, that they sort of they just fall over themselves. But what they are doing is they're acting as old-fashioned bishops. They're just confirming the faithful in the atheistic faith that their beliefs are sound and sensible. So they're, they're mobilising the uh, dynamic of celebrity to uh, authorise the atheist belief of the society. And, of course, atheism is a religious belief like any other. But it's such a weird belief. It's so... Um, I, I do believe that you cannot rationally prove God or disprove God, but God is certainly rationally the most likely explanation and everything in the new atheist case was just on its face so abundantly absurd so they say the universe is 14 billion old 14 billion years old well obviously god wouldn't waste his time spending 14 billion years before every how would they know what god would do <laughs> not only that it strikes me as absolutely characteristic of god that he would spend 14 billion years preparing a beautiful gift uh, that's not an argument that's just a prejudice on on their part Similarly, one of the uh, central arguments they make is that religion is improbable, therefore it's untrue. But the explanations they provide as alternatives are so unbelievably improbable and require such magical thinking. So, for example, one of the reasons to believe rationally in religion is that all human beings, almost all human beings, all throughout history and across all cultures, have had a hunger for God. And our strongest desires always indicate a corresponding strong reality. So we're hungry, that indicates food. We're lonely, that indicates friendship. Every desire we have, we're tired, that indicates the reality of sleep. Every profound desire we have indicates a corresponding reality. So how do you deal then with the profound uh, desire uh, for God? So some evolutionary atheists say, well, the religious disposition is just a pro-survival wrinkle of the human mind because it pr promotes uh, cooperation. And therefore, now that we've passed through that stage of evolution, we can dispense with that. But of course, that argument can be turned on the atheists themselves. How do we know that their latest view is not just an evolutionary outcrop of the human mind, just a, a, a strange oubliette of evolutionary uh, development? Why, is, why do we believe that's true? Another problem they have is that um, human life and all life is so improbable. Our universe is so improbable. If the Big Bang had been a bit stronger, the planets would have just kept shooting away. If it had been a bit weaker, the planets would have uh, collapsed back in on themselves. The, the sweet spot which produced the universe and then the sweet spot which produced carbon, which produced life, then the sweet spot which produced any kind of living creature, it's all so unbelievably improbable. Now, the fact that a thing is not is improbable doesn't mean it's not true. And believe me, that's one thing that a life in journalism teaches you, especially a life in political journalism. <laughs> Only things which are improbable are true. Um, <laughs> but the atheists then have this problem. So how do they explain the improbability of our universe when it's the improbability of religion which they've used to attack religion? So one of their explanations is to say, well, obviously there are an infinite number of universes and we've just lucked into the one 
which happens to be good for life. So you think to yourself, to use that marvellous uh, Yiddish saying, Oy vey! <laughs> you don't believe in God, but you believe in an infinite number of universes without a speck of evidence? And this is a kind of laughable argument. Where did this idea of an infinite number of universes? There's no evidence for it. It's a preposterous idea. And yet this is the kind of honoured thinking of our time. This is sophisticated honoured thinking. So I thought these arguments are so feeble that anyone could pull them apart. So let's have a, let's have a go and do it. And of course, it's, it's really shooting, uh, you know, shooting fish in a barrel. It's, it's, it's not really hard work. It's not really a man's work. But nonetheless, it's good fun. And uh, <laughs> so there was a belief, which, a, a chapter which I enjoyed on the rational belief. Then there are a few other chapters which I want to alert you to. One was on the Old Testament. The Old Testament gets a terrifically bad press, especially from the new atheists. They say the God of the Old Testament is homophobic, genocidal, misogynist, uh, control freak, blah, 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 blah. And of course, they spectacularly misrepresent the Old Testament. I must say that I benefited tremendously from Jewish commentators on uh, what in the Jewish tradition would be called the Hebrew Bible, in the Christian tradition is called the Old Testament, because Christians understandably read the Old Testament looking for the New Testament. But in fact, it's good to respond to the Old Testament just as a, a reader, just as a journalist, just as a human being. And it is a great, great, great story, full of great individual stories. It had very good sub-editors. It's mostly, <laughs> it always names the names, it always humanises the story, it always moves along at a rollicking pace. Some of it is written like a very elevated leader in the Australian, but a lot of it is written in the style of the Daily Telegraph and the Herald Sun. <laughs> and it is fantastic. It is fabulous to read. The book of Jonah. Jonah's sent to Nineveh to preach to a bunch of people he hates and he doesn't want to save them because they're rotten and he tries to run away and God flings him into a whale for three days and then he has to come back and has to preach to these Ninevites and no, goodness me, they actually accept his preaching and they repent. He's like uh, the Mel Brooks characters in The Producers, you know, that they created this musical to fail and instead it succeeded. And Jonah is angry. Now, there are very serious and profound lessons in Jonah, not only about obedience, but about the universality of God. And the universality of the God of the Old Testament is, is come back time and time and time again against all the popular press, which says the Old Testament God is local and not loving. In fact, the Old Testament God is is universal and loving. So he forgives the people of Nineveh and he uh, spares them the terrible fate that he had foretold them because they repent. In the book of Ruth, Ruth is, is a Moabite. The Moabites are enemies of the, of the Israelites. And Ruth uh, marries Naomi's son. Naomi's son dies. Ruth moves back from Moab country to Bethlehem and she sends her daughters-in-law away and Ruth won't leave and she utters that magnificent declaration of passionate human solidarity. Where you go, I will go. Where you rest, I will rest. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people and may the Lord punish me if anything but death separates us. And then it, it is a great, great short story, Ruth. It is the best short story I've ever read. And in the end, Ruth saves Naomi and then Naomi saves Ruth. And then Ruth becomes the great grandmother of David, the greatest of the Israelite kings, a central figure in the Bible, has a Moabite great grandmother. Again, the universality, the melody of the particular and the universal. But how, this is um, a bit of a digression in a way, but how can you just wipe that out of the, of the human consciousness and say that we're not going to we're not going to expose our kids to that. They're going to have to do the safe schools program, but they're not, <laughs> under no circumstances, they're going to read the book of Ruth. And then the final chapter I'll, um, I'll tell you about was a chapter about the Middle Ages, which is heavily indebted and, and, you know, very explicitly and honestly indebted to great Oxford scholar Larry Siddentop. So the, the cartoon version of intellectual history is the early Christians tried to live by the gospel, were persecuted. Constantine converted. Christianity became the state religion. Then Christians persecuted everybody else. We got a thousand ages of the a thousand years of the dark ages. Nothing good happened. It was all superstitious. 
The world was run by terrible priests. And then, hallelujah, we got the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and we repudiated superstition and modern decency began. Wrong, 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 wrong. Every aspect of it is wrong. In fact, everything we like in modern liberalism emerges organically from Christianity and is debated and elucidated throughout the Middle Ages. So very early on, in the very early church, there are debates about religious freedom. Now, of course, Christians often did not live up to the tenets of religious freedom. Obviously, it goes without saying, I'm not whitewashing the sins and crimes of Christians at, at any point. But there are great statements in favour of religious freedom. The early church was a great proponent of human rights because every human being had an immortal relationship with God. So did women, so did slaves, so did foreigners. All the people marginalised in the ancient world were suddenly given human dignity. The new morality was a better deal for women than anything that had ever gone before. The great uh, interesting historian Rodney Stark says that it was the appeal to women which led to the great expansion of Christianity because it was so much better a deal for women than had ever gone before. Christian families didn't kill their, their female children, so they had a lot more daughters than other families, and the daughters eventually, you know, uh, told their husbands what to do, which is the normal <laughs> circumstance. And uh, so the husbands converted as a result of the, of the women converting. The uh, dialogue about what is church and what is state uh, was a very long dialogue all through the Middle Ages. Pope's making great pronouncements. Yes, infidels have souls. The, the interplay of religious traditions. Thomas Aquinas, hugely influenced by Moses Maimonides. I, I always mispronounce that word. Um, this is a tremendously rich intellectual period of history, almost completely unknown to anyone in contemporary Western society, and yet it lays the foundations for contemporary Western society. So. My little contribution is a 30-page chapter which gives you the kind of, uh, you know, the cheat notes, at least uh, directs you to the primary sources. Then finally, the second half of the book is a reported part of the book about particular Christians. And the chapters which have got most attention were the two chapters I wrote about politicians. So I interviewed 14 serving and former politicians, including Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten. And when some extracts of this were run, the vituperativeness of online debate is such that instantly the online reaction was, ah, those typical Elmer Gantry politicians spruiking their beliefs, big hypocrites that they are, just trying to get the religious vote. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I tell you, the Brexit negotiations were a walk in the park compared to the complexity of the negotiations I had to undertake to get these politicians to, uh, <laughs> to agree to these interviews. Those very few people who have asked politicians about their religious beliefs have typically asked the question, what effect does your religious belief have on your uh, policy? That's a perfectly legitimate question. That's not the question I asked them. I asked them, what do you actually believe? Do you pray? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in an afterlife? Are you going to see your parents again? What do you think uh, is ultimately the deepest transcendent spiritual reality? And all of them, across the parties, from the left of the Labor Party to the conservative elements of the Liberal Party, impressed me profoundly with the depth of the inner life that they revealed, which they sedulously keep hidden from the public. Two of them had been sort of forced into becoming public Christians, Tony Abbott and Kevin Rudd. But the rest of them had really not ever spoken about these matters in public before. They were very, very reluctant to do so. And yet I was immensely impressed with each each one of them, and uh, there is a big hinterland, a deep inner life with all these people, and uh, it's a pity. Uh, I, I don't necessarily want them to become Americans where they wear their faith on their sleeve every minute of every day and ev everything is related to, to their notional, denominational faith affiliation, but I think we could do a bit better than never speaking about it at all. And the, the, un the subtext of that chapter was meant to be these are very smart people. They believe in Christianity. Maybe it's worth a second look. And then there's a series of other reported chapters. I found great dynamism and s a spirit of liveliness and great growth. I called one chapter Signs of New Life. So the overall picture of Christianity is of statistical decline, but there are tremendous movements that are doing 
fabulously well and I was utterly non-denominational about it. I was very impressed by the Pentecostal church that I went to see in Melbourne and I think successful religious movements have bold, strong leadership, a very clear message and worship which is coherent and beautiful. And my taste in church music tends more to Gregorian chant than rock and roll, but I'm a guy who has, there's a bit of the old rock and roller in me, so I, I love being at Planet Shakers, if you like rock and roll music, and it's, it's music based on the, you know, centred on the Bible. I found evangelical parishes in Perth that are doing parish planting, doing fantastic work, taking the ideas of Rod Dreher and the Benedict Option seriously, thickening their liturgy and so on. The magnificent Campion College in Sydney, without a drop of government money, has got the great Western civilization course that Ramsey <coughs> wants, to, uh, wants to invent. They've done it really uh, with no resources. They've just done it magnificently. And um, the Focolare movement, um, wonderful, wonderful effort by lay people to live, or predominantly lay people to live in the spirit of the early gospel. An Anglican vicar who has looked after, he's widowed, he's looked after his prof profoundly, profoundly disabled son, quadriplegic, cortical blindness, all the rest of it. In the end, I'm inspired by his life, but I also asked him, what does he think about Peter Singer's proposition that handicapped children should be, uh, should be killed uh, at, uh, sh shortly after birth, or, or that this at least would be a sensible option if the parents didn't want to spend the time looking after them? So to get his heartfelt response was not polemic, but uh, heartfelt. And the subtext of that whole, and then there's a, an interview too with Archbishop Anthony Fisher, among the most impressive of, of current churchmen. The subtext of that whole section is, hey, look, these Christians, they're quite interesting. These are rather interesting people. They're doing interesting things. And to criticise my own industry, the media doesn't cover this anymore. It only has two or three stories it does about religion. Oh. Child sexual abuse, a terrible, terrible thing and a legitimate story. And, um, you know, conservative Christians trying to keep women down and social justice Christians calling for revolution. It does those three stories, a variation of those three stories, over and over again, thousands. I know how the media feels. I mean, I do the Trump story over and over again. You know, Trump, Trump is going to be with me now, I fear, forever and ever. But uh, I thought all of that was rather neglected. Anyway, there it is. I leave it with you. Sit down over there, Greg. Well, Greg, that was terrific. Sound and style and substance. Thank you very much. And now to the second phase of uh, this evening's proceedings, a conversation. Um, Peter Curdy is a senior research fellow here at CIS, and he's also author of uh, The Tyranny of Tolerance. That was published last year, The Tyranny of Tolerance, to which the former Prime Minister, John Howard, wrote a glowing uh, tribute in his introduction. Uh, Peter and Greg will have a conversation about Greg's book before taking questions. Peter, over to you. Thanks, Tom. And Greg, thank you for being here tonight, and congratulations on the publication of God is Good For You. You've told us why, why you wrote the book, but as I was listening to you, I was wondering, who did you write the book for? D were you, did you have in mind uh, a disciple of Richard Dawkins that you were wrestling with? <laughs> or are you writing for the, that group of Christians you're calling now to be a bold minority and getting them to gird their loins? Who did you have in mind? Well, uh, uh, um, a very fair question, and um, the truth is, uh, I don't know really. Um, I write books partly in in my head for my sons. I think this is something you ought to know. They very sensibly don't read my books uh, <laughs> because I'm their dad. I'm not their author, you know. But nonetheless, I think this is something I'd like I'd like them to know. And I have a I have a, a fantasy that you know, when I'm um, you know singing in the celestial clouds and they've retired, they'll say, well, I wonder what the old man was on about, you know, and they'll read it. But look, uh, it's intentionally non-denominational and it intentionally comes from first principles. So I hope Christians looking for a bit of encouragement might read it and even if they find things that I've got wrong or that they disagree with, they might be encouraged by, by seeing these arguments made and these other voices. I hope that open-minded atheists might read it, that... Um, it's perfectly okay to, to be an atheist. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a rational position and all of that. But it's good to know what you're rejecting rather than rejecting a caricature or a fantasy of something. Um, and uh, I guess uh, I hope that, that it's a book 
you see, because I think this is a mainstream subject which ought to be open to mainstream people, I think there's a, there's a certain uh, utility for the book uh, across society, as it were. So it, it wasn't meant to be a narrow cast book for, you know, I'm after this, this demographic and this, uh, this little group of people. I mean, we in, the, in what is sometimes wickedly called the legacy media, but I like to call the, the quality media, <laughs> uh, w we are aiming always for a broad conversation. Uh, we, uh, society is better, it's more civilised, when lots and lots of people with different views uh, come together and talk things over. And that's presumably part of the situational awareness that you talk about in various stages of the book. You, you alert people, particularly Christians, I think, to the need for what you call, it's a military image, I think, you use, of situational awareness. Is that, just, is that more than just knowing what, to, what the, the cultural terrain is? Is there more to it than that? Well, I have a tremendous weakness for military metaphors, you know, uh, and a lot of Christians don't like it. That's one of the many things they don't like about me. But look, really, if that's the worst <laughs> thing they can say about me, I could tell them much, much worse <laughs> things that they could dislike. But um, the, 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 the force in the battle which wins is typically the force with superior situational awareness. And it's, it is a term of art in the military. And what it means specifically is the ability to integrate a lot of information which comes from many diverse sources in real time, in battle space time, as they call it. So you want to know who's on your right flank, who's on your left flank, how many, you know, how it's as your enemy's got, all that sort of thing. And I think one of the problems with Christianity is that even believing Christians have not quite realised the cultural circumstances that they're in, where in effect we are a minority. Now, it's liberating to be a minority. You go on the attack instead of being on the defence. You don't mind being attacked yourself. You expect it. That's, uh, you, you're psychologically much more prepared for it. Whereas if you still think that you're, that you're representing a settled consensus, that's, uh, that's very problematic because um, the society won't ever, won't ever uh, live up to that and your response won't be very effective. Uh, to those to those challenges, you're coming at this as a foreign correspondent, uh, mm. as a foreign editor of, m of many years standing. You've travelled the world. You've seen uh, many areas of conflict. One of the big arguments against uh, religion, as you know, is that it's the source of wars, a source of conflict, and religion causes more wars than anything else. In the course of your travels and your work, do you think that's true? No, I don't really. I, I would say historically, one of so the book also tries to trace the causes of, of why we got to this atheist moment. And one of the causes is the reputational damage that was done to Christianity by the wars of religion. There's no doubt. Uh, we Catholics persecuted Protestants, Protestants persecuted Catholics. We all were fighting with each other. Very often it was, in fact, just one state fighting with another state, but they gave it a religious, uh, a religious identity. Uh, so that... That was a grievous blow to the reputation of Christianity historically. The contemporary situation, um, I don't think all religions are the same. And, uh, you know, there are people who pursue conflict in the name of, of religion. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote a beautiful book about this, Not in, mm. not in God's <coughs> Name. Um, and, okay, this is more a problem in the Islamic world. And my book doesn't write about Islam because it hasn't been formative in the West and it hasn't been formative in my life and it's basically a book about Christianity. I don't think religion causes conflict, but religion, Judaism, Christianity, Sikhism, which I know very well, doesn't magically transform its adherents into no longer suffering from the problems of the human condition. I mean, we are a fallen species, you know, and in the human condition is a tendency to war and violence and conflict. And religion is always trying to tame the beast and appeal to the better angels. Uh, it's, it's not always successful. But I don't believe religion itself uh, causes war. Uh, certainly I don't believe Christianity or Judaism or Sikhism, the three religions I write about, cause war anywhere in the world. Uh, you can make a bit of a case about... Uh, Islam, even there I think it's very often sort of state power and there can be intercommunal hostility which uh, I, on the other hand I'm a bit unhappy about the very things I'm saying because I think it's always mealy mouthed if, you, if somebody says they're going to war because of a religious conviction 
you've got to sort of take them at their word. So I think Islamic State mm. uh, falls into that category and Al-Qaeda. But on the other hand, spending enormous amount of my time in Southeast Asia, I don't think Southeast Asian Muslims are inclined to go to war for religion. That's not to say they have a perfect record of tolerance either. But I don't, in general, I don't think religion causes war. And of course, whenever you take religion away, you get something much worse. You get Robespierre, or you get Pol Pot, or you get Stalin. Mentioning Southeast Asia, and you referred to, uh, in the book to the fact, and in your remarks, that it is a profoundly religious region. It sounds to me as though y you fear that if we don't take religion seriously in our society, we're going to miss something of great importance uh, in the countries that form our, our neighbourhood, as it were. I think that's true, although that's not a very important a reason for having religious belief. I mean, I, you know, uh, although I recount a little incident in the book where I'm intervie interviewing the Coptic Pope, the Egyptian Coptic Pope, mm. Pope Tawadros, and uh, we have a very nice, friendly interview. He speaks quite good English, and uh, everything's rolling along pretty well. And um, he's very cautious about what he'll say about the Egyptian government. And then I say to him, now, uh, Your Holiness, have you, were you as a young man ever tempted by atheism? Uh, he says, what? What, what? what are you talking about? And I rephrase the question. He says, could you just explain that again? And I rephrase the question again. A bit mystified, he turns to his advisor, who speaks better English than he does. <coughs> they have a long uh, <laughs> exchange in what I presume is Arabic, although maybe they were speaking the Coptic language. But um, in any event, I didn't know what they were saying. But finally, the Pope sort of smiles broadly, laughs a bit, turns back to me and says, no, 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 I was never tempted by that. And I can see in his eyes for the first time the feeling, God, they're weird, these Australians. <laughs> 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 Are really weird people, you know. <laughs> and uh, up till then, he thought he was dealing with a more or less sentient human being. <laughs> and now, but I do think that's a very minor reason for attaching ourselves to religion. I, generally speaking, we relate to Southeast Asia in a more or less unknowing way. The culture, of, except the immigrant experience, we, we're not really very expert in Southeast Asia. We're, I think we're very feeble at it, really, despite what we tell ourselves. But I think the loss of God is much more important for what it means for us ourselves, although it does have this geostrategic consequence. I just read a marvellous novel by Piers Paul Reed called Scarpia, in which he tries to show that really the, um, the heroine of Tosca is the villainess and the policeman Scarpia is the good guy. A bit hard to show that, really, but it's only a novel. And um, Scarpia is talking about whatever it is, 12th century Florence, and he's talking about how sybaritic and self-indulgent it's become, and how hedonistic and undisciplined. And he says, well, in a way, it's not a bad life. But you know what? A man is not going to give his life to defend sybaritism. And we are going to be competing with much more vigorous societies. And I wonder if we have no belief in the transcendent, if we'll have sufficient vigour and belief in ourselves to uh, prevail, so to speak, in those geostrategic circumstances. And an important part of that is doubt. And, and you, you like paradoxes uh, as a good Catholic, or a Catholic, I shouldn't say good Catholic. <laughs> um, but you, uh, you, you talk about the paradox of doubt and the importance of doubt, actually, in, in, in the life of faith, which is a difficult thing to explain to people who are not believers. H how do you yourself live with that sense of the paradox of doubt? Well, the great thing, uh, journalism you know, is a tremendously, uh, uh, it can have effects on the human soul which are not entirely always fabulous, you know. Uh, but it does have some great lessons, which is if you want the copy uh, tonight, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's got to be now, you know. And you always have to live with doubt, otherwise you couldn't, uh, you couldn't function. And of course, the, the calumnies against faith are so great that we no longer understand that faith is really the basis of reason. So my parents told me that I'm their son. Um, I, I think they're probably telling me the truth. But I haven't really established it and proven it. I, I don't have any uh, proof that this is the case. I haven't taken any DNA swabs and, and established beyond a doubt. So it's a justified belief. It's a reasonable belief. But the reason I believe it is because I have faith that they are telling me the truth. And 90% of the things we believe in life, we believe on the basis of faith of that kind. It's not irrational, but the belief is not a belief of rational proof. And uh, one of the polemical tricks of atheists is to say any paradox or any doubt 
means that the whole mm. thing is untrue. Whereas, of course, <coughs> you know, God, for his own reasons, set things up so that you can come to him rationally and you can believe in him with faith, but it's not self-evident. Because if it was self-evident, you wouldn't need faith. That's the human condition. And the fact that you don't understand everything about the human condition. I'll give you one other example. Peter. I believe in the doctrine of the, the bodily resurrection so that people will, will uh, live on eventually in a, in a physical form. But the human body seems inherently built for decay and corruption and change. So how is that going to work through eternity? I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me that I don't know. There are an infinity of things that I don't know. I put the key in my car. I have no idea why it works. I, I absolutely, I have even less idea why my computer works. It still works. Do you think the politicians you talk to are also comfortable with the, the paradox of doubt? I was very impressed by these politicians, and I think they're much more um, as individuals. So I'm not really making a, a claim about the political class. These are 14 individuals who I interviewed. And I guess I knew that they all had some element of faith in their lives or I wouldn't have tried to interview them. And uh, I was very impressed with the way <coughs> they dealt with this in their own lives. I mean, Penny Wong said to me, uh, most things I approach intellectually, I don't approach religion intellectually. Uh, and I've never, <coughs> never had the thought that I could live without God. And there is um, an experiential element, uh, as, as there is for most people. So Roger Scruton, in that lovely book, um, whose name I've just forgotten, but I, I cite it a lot in my book, argues that the strongest, the strongest rational reason for belief in God is the long human experience of God. Of course, the atheists won't allow that any human experience of God is valid. They say that that's all mm. just mumbo-jumbo. It's psychobabble or something. But in reality, you can't deny that experience. So... Rationality, if you take it to an extreme, hyper-rationality, it's not actually rational any longer because rationality is just a part of the, f the, the portfolio of human faculties which we use to try to discern the truth. Intuition, emotion, many, many other things come into it and, of course, experience. So all of those politicians, I thought, had uh, in their own lives, as they revealed to me in these interviews, I, I don't want to verbal them, really, and I don't want to generalise about them, but I thought they had all... Uh, come to grips with these matters quite quite uh, extensively. So in some ways, I think that we get anxious about the, the lack of rationality in religious belief when we hear politicians talking about religion, that we don't want politics to be uh, tainted by irrationality. And yet I thought it was the, actually it was the, the bit of the book I, start, I started in the middle and worked to the end and then went the other way. Uh, and I was struck by the fact that you say a number of times in the book that Christianity does not adjudicate between left and right, and that comes through very clearly in the interviews with the politicians. It left me wondering, though, whether you think, uh, this sounds like a, a, like a slightly impertinent question, but does Christianity have anything to say in politics, or should it be uh, completely free? Should, should religion and Christianity get out of, of the, the political arena? If it's not able to adjudicate, what, maybe another way of asking the question is, what does it bring to religion, uh, to politics, rather? Yeah, so that's a good, complicated, difficult <laughs> question, uh, which I can easily answer in an aphorism or two without any, without any trouble at all. Christianity certainly does bring things to politics, but it doesn't adjudicate between um, policies which are well-intentioned and which are not inherently evil. So a lot of people on the social democratic left quite reasonably say they are inspired by the social justice tradition of Christianity. That's perfectly okay. A lot of people on the free market side of politics are a bit um, tongue-tied about religion. And one of the great pioneers of changing that was Michael Novak, uh, of course. Mm. And, but really, they're pursuing the same end. They're pursuing the end of human welfare. So in India, a key policymaker said to me once, you know, the critical thing in India to alleviate poverty is to enlarge the formal sector of employment. Because when you move off the farm into working for an employer, your life experience is vastly uh, better materially than when you're living subsistence on the farm. One of the reasons we can't increase the formal sector is because we have insanely restrictive trade union laws which are designed to benefit 
uh, trade unions. Now, the original impulse for passing those laws was to benefit a worker as opposed to a boss, so someone with less power as opposed to someone with more power. The consequence of that policy is to freeze out millions of people from a more affluent life. Now, uh, the person I was talking to, I presume, was a Hindu, but, but what, what would Christianity say about this? Christianity would say that the desire to help a large number of people or to help everyone, that is, that is the Christian imperative. But if you come to the view that you can help people by deregulating the labour market and someone else comes to the view that you can help people by uh, more regulation in the labour market, I don't think Christianity adjudicates between those two things. Mm. Christianity certainly adjudicates about the sanctity of life. Uh, certainly adjudicates about the the need for for human dignity to be respected. Uh, it's one reason it has such a lot to say about the life issues, and it infuses an ethic, which is uh, to seek the good, uh, and to be altruistic, mm. to love the stranger, and so on. Uh, it's not the only religion that has those ethics, but it certainly does have those ethics. But mostly, politics is fairly straightforward and and dull. Really, I would hate the most profound experience of my life to be adjudicating between whether Bill Shorten's approach to tax cuts or Malcolm <laughs> Turnbull's approach. I mean, it's kind of interesting, you know, and it sells newspapers and it is important, but that's not the essence of life. That's not, you know, the essence of life is much, uh, much deeper than that. And the, the robust Australian disinterest in politics can be a problem, but in many ways it's a very good thing. You know, Australians are, are concerned with much more important things than who runs the post office. It, it's very important that people be concerned with who runs the post office. Got to get that sort of stuff right. But that's not the transcendent stuff of humanity. Do you get the sense that the politicians that you spoke to, and perhaps the political class more broadly, takes the issue of religious freedom seriously? That's suddenly becoming a very uh, a hot topic. We've, uh, we're waiting for the, for the uh, rubbish inquiry to be handed down. Well, it's been handed down. We'll try to find out what he said. Um, and it's, it's likely to be a contention issue at some point within the next year or so. Do you think politicians are concerned about the limits of religious freedom? I think they're rather confused about it. I'm not talking about the 14 politicians I, viewed, I interviewed because I didn't ask them about this issue, so it would be unfair for me to comment about them in relation to this issue. But to comment generally about politicians, I think they're very confused about the issue. Christians and other religious people in Western societies are not persecuted in the way Christians are persecuted in the Middle East or in Pakistan or in China. Nonetheless, the environment is becoming more hostile. Um, Stephen McAlpine, an evangelical pastor from Perth that I quote, says, Christians are now living in exile. They expected to go into exile in Athens, where there would be a lot of interesting discussion. Instead, they find themselves in exile in Babylon. And the, the, the secular culture is becoming much more hostile to Christianity. And there will be a series of issues about religious freedom there will be an assault on Christian institutions. I mean, the famous, one of the famous cases we know, Archbishop Julian Portis, the Catholic Archbishop of Tasmania, of Hobart, published a pamphlet, extremely modest, mildly worded, decent, gentle pamphlet, uh, um, arguing the traditional case for, for the traditional definition of marriage. And a complaint was made against, the, against him at the Anti-Discrimination Commission, and the Anti-Discrimination Commission was going to hear the complaint complaint was subsequently withdrawn. We're going to get a vast multiplicity of that sort of thing. I think the, uh, I'll tell you honestly, I think the decision to intrude on the seal of the confessional is, is uh, a wrong abridgment of religious freedom, won't, certainly won't do anything to help abuse children. Um, there's going to be a battle over what schools, what schools and uh, Christian universities can teach um, already. You're seeing quite a lot of that. You've seen a lot of that in, uh, in the UK and in Canada and so on. I think the, the state is now going to increasingly be inclined to use coercive power to intimidate Christian institutions. And one reason I want the uh, Christian leadership to think of its community as a bold minority is that they must draw red lines and not retreat. I mean, my advice to Archbishop Porteous, who's a splendid man, he doesn't need my advice, but my advice to him would have been to require every priest in his diocese the next Sunday to read that letter out from start to finish. And the whole lot of them could present themselves on Hobart Town Hall for mass <laughs> arrest and say, OK, arrest us if you like, do your worst. And 
really, you know, the church is browbeaten at the moment. It's, it's rightly ashamed of the child abuse scandals and so forth. But it still has to go forth and proclaim its message. And uh, it has to use the institutions it owns much more explicitly for Christian purposes. How can there be Christian schools in which there is not a period every day devoted to religious education? How can there be a Christian school where kids can leave at the end of their schooling and not know the fundamental tenets of Christianity? One proposition I advance in the book is, say in year nine, at every Christian school, get every kid to spend a year or at least a semester going through the Apostles' Creed mm. in a systematic way. So that's not going to turn them into lifelong Christians, but it will mean once in their life they got a systematic statement of what Christian beliefs actually really are. There's a lot of sociological evidence that young folks in the US, whatever their denominational affiliation, know almost nothing about the beliefs of their churches. So that's not only the culture being hostile, that's a failure of the churches as well. Thanks, Greg. Let's, um, I could ask you more complex questions, <laughs> but we'll give members of the audience a chance to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And my colleague Lulu will take this microphone. And questions for Greg? Yes, this lady in the front row. If you could just wait for the microphone to come to you and then speak into the microphone, that would be great. Uh, if there was a agnostic Muslim, I mean someone who lapsed from Islam and read your book, do you think they would also say, uh, yes, I think maybe God is good for us? I, I don't know. I hope so. And uh, I, hope, I hope some non-lapsed Muslims will read the book as well. And because uh, people of different religious traditions, they appreciate and enjoy their traditions. I mean, I, I've spent a part of my life studying Judaism and part of my life studying Sikhism. I've got to know quite a, a lot of Hinduism through spending so much time in India, uh, less deep acquaintance with Buddhism. It's, it's interesting stuff. It's not, uh, it's not wicked or, or foreign or anything. I, I don't think any Muslim would read my book and find it distressing. Uh, Mr. Sheridan, there's a famous story um, when Napoleon Bonaparte was meeting with the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Consalvi, and Napoleon said to him, don't you know how I have the power to destroy the church? to which the Cardinal responded, we bishops have been trying to do that for 1800 years and we haven't succeeded. Um, I, given some of the recent high profile scandals cons um, concerning some of the church leadership, both in Australia and overseas and the US and so on, do you think that is going to drive away a lot of Christians from the church? Or do you think on the other hand, Christians do understand the distinction between the personal holiness of some particular bishops and the truth of the teachings uh, which, which they espouse. That episode with Napoleon is, is really quite magnificent. And uh, some of these cardinals are pretty uh, clever. They're, they're pretty nifty uh, old fellows, really. So look, I do have a chapter in the book uh, called The Sins of Christians. And um, Christians have done terrible things, obviously. There are two and a half billion Christians in the world and they, they span the whole gamut of virtue and vice. Uh, and, and that you could possibly imagine. And Christians historically have done bad things, sometimes in the name of the church. They've been wrong to do so. They've been condemned for doing so. And there's always been a contrary voice uh, against that. The child abuse scandal, very complex and difficult thing to deal with. It's a terrible, terrible business. And the most important people in it are the victims. And you should do everything you can to make sure it never happens again and that the victims are cared for. At the same time, it happened in many institutions other than Christian institutions. I don't think it teaches you anything especially toxic about Christianity. It does teach you about the fallen nature of human beings. And, you know, the road between heroic virtue and shocking vice is often, the line between them, rather, is often a very, very narrow line. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said the road between, the line between good and evil runs down the middle of every human heart. And history is not replete with stories of good people versus bad people. It, it's replete with stories of people who, who had good and bad within them in, in, at war all the time. Having said that, though, I think the churches, including my own church, handled this matter very, very badly. And they were badly advised by psychiatrists. This is mainly a historic problem. But 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, psychiatrists advised them that people could just say they were sorry and they wouldn't do it again. Whereas, in fact, now we understand that this kind of behaviour is deeply pathological. 
and that once it's been exhibited, the person shouldn't be allowed near kids ever again, whether they spend the rest of their lives in jail or whatever, that's another question, but they certainly shouldn't be allowed anywhere near kids. Um, it, it is the most disturbing thing I've ever learned about my own church. Now, you know, I grew up, I went to the Christian Brothers, the nuns, I was an altar boy for three years, or so for a few years anyway. I spent a year in a seminary seeing if I could become a redemptorist priest. I worked for a time for the Catholic Weekly. I was in so, so many Catholic youth groups, I've forgotten them. And I never heard the faintest whisper or suggestion of anything like this. So it's not something that was a, you know, a, a, um, a well-known secret or something. Nobody had any idea of this hideous underworld. And I do think it shows you that you can't let human beings have unfettered power over other human beings. There's got to be scrutiny and accountability and so on. That's sadly that's true for church leaders as it is for everybody else. Hi, Greg. Um, I would like to know what are your thoughts on the Christian atheists, people who don't believe in God, but they do think that Judeo-Christian values are still important in um, maintaining a foundation. Do you think? This, um, it's an oxymoron, and would you be okay with that? Would, or basically, my qu question is, would you be okay with people not believing in a, in a God, but they still think that Judeo-Christian values are still important? Look, you know, in the words of the great 60s um, guru, I'm okay with everybody. I I'm okay, you're okay. Um, I don't mind what people believe. It's a free society. They can believe anything they like. I think the term a Christian atheist is an oxymoron, obviously, but I, I do get the point that you're coming to, that you're, that, you're, that you're driving at, and I have a lot of sympathy with it. There's a, a person who would be known to many people in this room, the late David Armstrong, the great philosopher uh, at Sydney University. He used to say to me in that characteristic way, well, you know, Greg, I am really a pre-Vatican II atheist. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I thought there was a lot. I understood exactly what he meant, you know. And... Um, there are a lot of people like that. I'm not sure that Roger Scruton uh, is actually a religious believer. Douglas Murray, who wrote that splendid book, the, the Strange Death of Europe, is not a religious believer. So these people do assert, recognise and understand the values of the Judeo-Christian tradition. God bless them. That's great. I would say that it's very hard to sustain those values when they're cut off completely from their roots. Uh, yes, I, I don't understand this arbitrary division of the whole world into Western civilization and Eastern civilization when the religion you're talking about, Christianity, is an Eastern religion. It came from Palestine or Bethlehem, whichever way you want to look at it. And some of the, some of the dumbest ideas going have actually come out of the West, like communism, for instance, came from Marx and Engels, who were German, and all the safe skills rubbish is, is a European invention. The Chinese and the Indians and the Muslims, they don't want any part of it. So why do you make this arbitrary division between Western civilization and Eastern civilization? Well, in fact, I don't. And um, uh, you must be listening to someone else or reading another newspaper columnist or something. Um, Christianity is a universal religion which is open to everyone. However, in the development of Western civilization, Christianity played a unique and, and, and crucial role. And of course, as I've said, you know, five or six times this talk, but millions of times previously, there are massive evil things in the history of Western civilization. Communism was a Western ideology, so was Nazism. They both grew up in, uh, in Christian Europe. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So, uh, and wanting to celebrate Western civilization is not wanting to write an arbitrary boundary uh, at the barrier of civilization and say you're Western and you're not. Uh, that's ridiculous. But you have to think of human knowledge and human traditions in some categories. So unless you reject ontologically the proposition of categories, you have to have a category. I if you talk about Japanese civilization, most people know what you mean. Uh, the Japanese certainly know what you mean. But you could easily say to the Japanese, oh, well, you're forgetting the influence of uh, Commodore Perry and uh, the westernization process you underwent after the Meiji Restoration. Uh, but, well, that's all fine. But uh, these terms are shorthand terms. I mean. You don't have enough uh, text to in introduce all the caveats every time. 
But the very fact that we now regard it as sort of an offence against public decency to talk about Western civilization, I think, is is very problematic. And, and as I mentioned to you, if you if you studied the great texts of Western civilization, they're all critical texts anyway. Uh, they're they're advancing knowledge in a typical Western fashion, typically by criticising the knowledge which has come immediately uh, before and uh, finding out what they want to continue and what they want to uh, to discard. So I, I don't. I think that's a kind of a it's a false problem, really. Sophie. Greg, thank you very much for that, Sophie York. Um, you mentioned Christianity has been very good for the status of women, and I agree. Uh, Sonia Kruger, Channel 9 presenter, recently mentioned that she was concerned about the rate of Muslim immigration, and she's now facing court for that comment. And I, I'm just curious about two things. Firstly, why I are we not allowed to, why is she not allowed to express her genuine concern about a change in culture which might disadvantage women? if the dominant culture changes to an extreme version of Islam where women don't fare very well, um, for whether it's via immigration or via high birth rate? And secondly, why did no society leaders come out in support of her? Why is she now facing court? It's a legitimate concern. Yeah, no, they, uh, look, I agree with the thrust of that point entirely, Sophie. Uh, I, I think um, the efforts to curtail free speech are very... Um, inconsistent and weird and, and ideologically loaded. Uh, so in, in this discussion about... I, I'm not going to comment on Sonia Kruger, but I, I, I agree with the thrust of your comments. But let me, let me give you a different example. In this discussion about the Ramsey Centre, uh, you know, I made some generally captious remarks about academics and so on. So a professor of history at Sydney University wrote an article for the ABC Religion and Ethics website, which was the editor's choice of the day, in which he said, God bless him, Greg Sheridan is clearly uh, a follower of the same ideas as Steve Bannon and Anders Brevik. Now, Anders Brevik killed 87 people, you know. <laughs> and, and Dirk Moses, uh, the, this historian, also said, uh, clearly Greg Sheridan is worried about the loss of racial purity of Western society. <laughs> Give me a break. I mean, this is bizarre. And uh, now... Before I could work myself, I mean, I, I don't mind Dirk Moses having a shot at me. That's, you know, if a dopey left-wing Sydney University academic can't have a shot at the Australian, we've come to a pretty pass. <laughs> but, but, but on the other hand, the absolute lack of reaction to it was pretty bizarre. Now, the ABC, God bless them, having chosen it as their editor's choice and put it on their religion and ethics website, at some point they said... Anders Brevik. Hmm. <laughs> we don't like News Corp very much, but maybe, maybe that's one half a standard deviation too far. So they dropped Anders Brevik. I am apparently a follower of Steve Bannon and guilty, <laughs> guilty of all these other crimes that I was unaware of. But it, it, it is worth imagining. Imagine if one of us in this room had made an equivalent remark about some sort of suitably uh, important figure on the left, uh, there would be a hysterical screaming down. Now, I do believe debate everywhere is becoming very vituperative, and we on the right are not entirely innocent of this either. Uh, but, but I do think this is a very unhappy trend in our society, a very unhappy trend, and... Uh, it's part of liberalism going mad. You see, to re relate it back to my original thesis, liberalism in the 19th and 20th centuries was mostly a very good thing, and it was informed by its religious impulse. The, the welfare state, uh, rerum novarum, the great social encyclicals, the, um, the great drive to remove race as a basis of civic identity. These were fantastic liberal impulses, and liberalism was a very Christian uh, enterprise in those days. Now liberalism has divorced itself from its Christian parents, to mix my family metaphors uh, a bit promiscuously, and it's going mad. It can't work itself out. It, it has no idea where its limits are. It has no idea what its direction is. Uh, it's lost common sense. It's completely untethered from, uh, from common sense. It's lost its embedded position in a tradition. It's lost the, the, the qualifying and modifying aspects of, of tradition. And I think... Um, 
it's a bit of a harbinger of, of uh, I think we're going to see more of that. I'm going to ask a question which seeks to bring together a few of your favourite subjects. If, if you start with the assumption that uh, uh, Christianity is essentially adherence to and a belief in a set of values, a way of life, that sort of thing, how is it that in a country such as the United States, so many people who espouse those values and beliefs have essentially supported someone who has absolutely no values and supports someone, a valueless individual to lead them? Is that essentially a paradox, another of your favourite topics yeah. of modern Christianity, yeah. or is it that just fear and self-interest will always take priority over modern Christianity as we know it? I knew I couldn't escape Trump for a whole <laughs> evening. I knew it. I knew it. My whole life is a Trump universe now. I am appealing to the Geneva Convention and the United Nations to grant me Trump-free days, you know, <laughs> whole days where I don't have to worry about Trump, you know. If I write the most sophisticated analysis of the politics of Thailand, it'll get three hits and seven <laughs> comments, you know. If I say Donald Trump is a duck, there'll be a thousand comments within six minutes, you know. But let me, having indulged in that persiflage, give you a serious response. I was appalled at the emergence of Donald Trump. In fact, I was an extremist on this matter. I, I wrote a lot of front pages. When um, Ted Cruz won a primary, I went on the front page of The Australian and said, this is the best day Western civilization has had in months. You know. <laughs> and then I made a complete jackass of myself by going on TV and going on the front page of The Australian saying, Trump cannot win. <laughs> Hillary has won. And I'm alive to all of Hillary's many shortcomings, but, uh, you know, she wasn't a bad Secretary of State, and I interviewed her quite a lot, and I, I thought she had, a, had a good points. And I knew a lot of the people around her in foreign policy and national security, very good people, Kurt Campbell and Derek Mitchell and so on, very, very good people. And um, I realised that I was emotionally invested in the proposition that this man manifestly, without the character that a president should have, should not be president. However, I'd offer you two qualifying comments. I did also follow the debate within many American Christian journals and it was uh, at the level of good journals like, say, First Things, which I think is the best journal in the world, but a lot of other journals too. It was a very sophisticated and honest, serious debate. They did recognise what kind of person Trump was. They said, look, Trump is not one of us. He's not a man who exhibits the values that we admire. And normally, we wouldn't vote for a person like that. Remember when George W. Bush, when it was revealed that he'd had a drink driving charge as a young man, he lost half a percent. A million evangelicals stayed home. Good God, he, he was over the limit when he was 18, you know. He hadn't done a bad thing since he gave up the booze. Uh, but the debate in those journals was very cold-eyed and hard-headed. It said, the Clinton clan is also very ethically challenged. Here we have a binary choice, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. If Donald Trump is the president, he is going to support, he is going to appoint Supreme Court judge, judges who will not abridge our freedoms, who will not uh, make it illegal to have a, you know, a Christian law school, for example, which it's effectively become in Canada, uh, who will not um, force Catholic hospitals to, uh, you know, act against their conscience. This was a very sober debate. Some of them said we'll support him. Some of them said we won't. Now, that's not the debate at the popular level. At the popular level, a lot of, uh, you know, good old boys sort of uh, Christian folk just said, well, the New York Times hates him. That's good enough for me. <laughs> and uh, CNN hates him. He must, be, he must have something going for him. And the more they hated him, the more the folks liked him. But there was quite a sophisticated, serious debate among serious, ethical, conscientious Christians. And I was a never-Trump conservative, like most of my friends in the Republican foreign policy establishment. But I don't condemn ethically any Christian who decided to vote for Donald Trump. And then the other point I'd make to you is, Trump has actually been a much better president than I thought he would be. He's, he's mad, of course. I mean, he's, you know, the things he says are kind of grotesque, you know. Half the time they bear no relation to reality. And Trump at 10 o'clock in the morning might be the absolute opposite from Trump at 2 in the afternoon, you know. 
And the people who are absolute loyal Trumpers, of which our readers, there are many, believe me, and they all think I'm a left-wing United Nations, one world government. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's nice to be... To Dirk Moses, I'm Anders Brevik, and to the Trumpers, I'm the United Nations. It's, uh, but, but if you really follow Trump all the way, it's just very hard. You've got to be very flexible and, and nimble, swift to change your position, you know. <laughs> But having said all that, he's done quite a lot of good things. He has repaired the US defence budget. That's probably the most important thing any president could do for Australian national security. I mean, I'm, that's my core concern, Australian national security. For Trump to end the terrible Obama years of tearing down the defence budget, that's, that's a profoundly good thing. His deregulatory low tax policy you notice that, I mean, every jackass in the country talks about inevitable US decline and the rise of China and so on. The US economy is twice as big as China's economy and it's growing by 4.1% at the moment. This is an astonishing rate of economic growth. He has appointed a very good judge and he's about to appoint another very good judge. That's critically important in America. Now, at the same time, he, you know, it's a circus. But... Uh, <laughs> But the other point I'd leave you with is this. Increasingly, Western politics is dominated by the dynamics of celebrity. The first pure celebrity candidate was Barack Obama, a di very different kind of celebrity. His most important endorsement was Oprah Winfrey. He hadn't done anything politically before he came to office, like Trump. He had no political achievements, and therefore he had no political baggage. He had, as a senator, often voted present, meaning he didn't vote aye or nay, because he didn't want to have a voting record which exhibited his principles. He ran as a conservative against gay marriage, not one, not red states, not blue states, but purple states, not black America, not white America, but the United States of America, and so on. And he also, like Trump, had the view that his own majestically sublime personality would cause geostrategic changes around the world. Trump shares exactly the same fallacy. In fact, there's a column I'll write one day about how Trump, uh, Obama, Pope Francis and Justin Trudeau are all <laughs> really the same leader uh, in disguise. I'll leave you with that provocative thought. Thanks. Another colleague of mine who's been very humble tonight is Lou. And we've got a lot, but the gentleman who caught my attention, my eyes, right at the back row. And by the door, thank you. Ah, thanks very much, Greg, for a very entertaining talk. And... Uh, for great work with the book and all your commentary. Just wondering if you'd like to comment further on Christianity in the universities and Christianity in university education. Yeah, well, the position of Christians at universities is very strange at the moment. I mean, Oxford University, a year or two ago, had orientation week and it banned the evangelical union, the, the Christian union, I think it was, because it said it wanted to provide a safe space. And, of course, it's very common for... Oxford undergraduates to be assaulted and bodily harmed by, uh, <laughs> by Christians uh, uh, in their orientation week. You know, who knew this was such a scourge? And uh, the, uh, all the campus bodies have taken this kind of action, this kind of low-grade, pathetic, harrying, harassing action. Now, I think many, many good things happen at universities, but I do think people who are really imbued with the values of Christianity, with a desire to prom promulgate the inheritance of Western civilization, they need, more than anything, they need to be founding new institutions. You know, this is part of the message of the Benedict Option. As I say, it's a, it's a wonderful book, but in some ways a difficult book. I don't agree with everything in it. But, you know, you, you look at something magnificent like Campion College. Instead of those people spending their lives complaining about the hideousness of what's happening at some state institution or trying to get, you know, a mainstream, even Catholic institution to be a bit closer to the, to, to the mainstream of churches. They've just founded a new institution. There it is. A couple of hundred students have gone through. Well, that's not... I wish it was 200,000, but it's a few hundred. It's a lot better than, than nobody. Um, I think, you know, the opportunities of digital media, although they're digital media is misused hugely, but the opportunities of digital media, institutions like the Centre for Independent Studies. I was at the Jewish Museum today. They, they have uh, 28,000 school kids through a year, and they teach school kids about the Holocaust. Now, you ought to learn about the Holocaust 
as, an, as a normal essential part of history. But whether you do or not, the Jewish community is going to educate 28,000 school kids about it every year. And I think it's, um, it's quite right to, to wage the battles about what is happening in our universities. It's absolutely right to do this. But I think it's even more fun to go and, and, uh, and found your own institutions. All you need is a lifetime of commitment, a willingness not to make any money, uh, <laughs> a desire to lead a punishing and difficult life, and very little prospect of success. But it's great fun. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Greg Sheridan and Peter Curdy. Well, we at the Centre for Independent Studies are uh, blessed to have a very distinguished uh, board of directors. And I'd like to call on one of my colleagues uh, to do the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Moore. Well, thank you, Greg. That was a really uh, entertaining and, and tremendous uh, 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 presentation tonight. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, finishing the book. I, I have started it and I have enjoyed what I've read so far. As, um, as Tom mentioned earlier, uh, the CIS is, is dedicated to a, a range of things. Uh, freedom, of course, most importantly, but most importantly of all, of course, is ideas. You know, we love ideas. We like them because they're interesting in and of themselves. We like debating them. We like doing research on the ideas. We've got lots of guys, as you know, putting out research all, all, all the time. But even though it's, it's fun to do ideas, what, why we really like them, of course, is that they matter. And they've never mattered more than today. Obviously, in the time of abundance that we're in, and indeed the last 200 years in, in terms of the abundance that's come in with the modern world, we have more choice. We have more choice as a people. We have more choice individually. And we know the devastating cost of bad ideas. The 20th century, as, as Tom's uh, uh, research recently indicated, was the, the disaster of the 20th century was the disaster so often of, of, of bad ideas. So CIS is, is dedicated to... Uh, 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 ideas and, and dedicated to debating them and getting the, the right ideas out. Now you've put a lot of your time in, so many thanks for that. You've come tonight with with your new book, which we are very grateful of. of, of, uh, of uh, very grateful of you sharing it with us. De dealing with, of course, one of the, the biggest ideas ever: the idea of, of God and what God means to us. Uh, you're a prophet, of course, in terms of what you're saying. Uh, situational awareness. I don't think I read that in the Old Testament, but I suspect that's what a prophet was telling us where we are today, how, how bad we are and how hostile the world is and actually reminding us about the importance of, of, of Christianity and, and religion and God more broadly to the society as a whole that we all live in, but just as importantly to the individuals and in terms of what you've done in your book of actually going out and interviewing people and showing what, what God actually means, I think is, uh, is very powerful indeed. Uh, of course, you've also dealt with the arguments against God in a, in a very powerful way. Uh, finally, of course, you've, you've shown us a, a way forward in terms of what we should all be doing individually. It's a, a call to action, as we like, a calling for bold lines of actually defining what Christianity uh, ch stands for, what religion more broadly stands for, uh, what we should be doing with education uh, and how we should be going forward. So uh, thank you very much, Greg, for this evening. It was very entertaining. It was very uh, thought-provoking. Best wishes of, with the book. I'm sure it will be a, a huge success. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing how it goes. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Nicholas, and uh, thank you too to Greg and to Peter, and thank you all of you for being here this evening. Um, three quick bookkeeping uh, issues. One is CIS relies primarily on the support uh, and membership of our, um, of our loyal followers. If, you, if you're not a member and you enjoyed tonight, please consider becoming a member and joining the CIS family. Uh, the second point is this, this book, um, God is Good For You. This will be sold at the back there at reception. Uh, Greg is happy to sign copies for you. And the third thing is our next public event will be in this room on, uh, in a fortnight. Uh, the subject is uh, the snowflake epidemic. <laughs> and <laughs> you can imagine what that is. Um, the universities, not all of them, but a lot of them increasingly uh, across the Western world are at the stage where many serious subjects uh, can't be debated or discussed openly without inspiring immediate hysteria. And we're going to have a great discussion about this issue. We have Tiffany Jenkins. She's from England. Uh, Claire Lehman, you may have heard of her. She's been a guest here at CIS. She's here from Sydney. And Lindsay Shepherd, she's from Canada. They're all young ladies, and they'll be talking with uh, our colleague, um, our colleague uh, Stephen Schwartz, uh, who's a senior fellow here at CIS, and also a former vice chancellor at universities, both here in this country 
and abroad. That will be here in a fortnight. And then on Monday, uh, uh, May, um, let's see, August 27, so that's uh, Monday fortnight, uh, the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott and I will be having a discussion and a debate about the challenges of a big Australia. Um, we at CIS have generally been supporters of a large immigration intake, but there is a great debate that's about to take place, and Tony Abbott is part of that debate. We welcome your uh, participation in that debate here on uh, August 27. Um, thank you so much. It's great to have you here, and we hope to see you again.